Hi, Glenn. Welcome to the podcast. How are you doing? All right, that's about it. How are you? A bit blurry this morning, but I'm getting there. Good, good. <laughs> um, it's an honour to have you on, really, because I'm a big fan of yours and the Sex Pistols, so it means a lot. Thank you for coming on. Oh, there you go. All right. Thanks for having us. Uh, you've had an eventful 2023. You've played at Glastonbury with Blondie. You had your new book and album out. I guess the only downfall to your year is watching QPR. Yeah, but we've got a new manager, so we'll see what happens. It's a shame we um, all like Gareth Ainsworth, but it didn't work out. So, um, yeah, we'll see what happens. He actually came. I got him tickets to come and see the Pistols at Brixton Academy, and he was injured at the time. And I got him and his other footballing mate, who was also injured at the time, and their two missuses. I got them in the disabled enclosure at Brixton Academy. <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, we'll get on to all of the Sex Pistols and that soon, but what was life like growing up in London before you joined the Sex Pistols? Um, what was it like? It kind of like what it was, really. It, you know, I was too young for the swing in 60s, and that's what kind of really affected me. All those bands like the Kinks and the Who and the Yardbirds and the Stones and stuff and all the fashions. And then I kind of went back to that when I started picking up the guitar properly and learning the bass. I mean, it was kind of a big influence, but um, it was a real kind of working class background. We lived on the top floor of a two up, two down with a tin bath and played football in the streets with me mates around the corner and, you know, did all, not youth club things, but they used to play football quite a lot for local teams and then my school. Um, yeah, but it, it, what was quite good about where I lived is a place called Cancel Green. It was quite, you've probably heard of Brixton, but you probably haven't heard of Cancel Green. But, you know, it was one of the first um, West Indian immigrant communities and all their kids, I was the same age, we all went to school together and, you know, got on well. It was a real sort of hands across the sea of about a racial divide, but they were mates, you know, but also... Their mums and dads would play kind of blue beat and scar on a hot day, you know, with the windows open. It was kind of cool, really. You know, you listen to the Scatterlights and King Tubby and stuff like that before, even before reggae came up. Yeah. What age did you get into music and play the guitar? Oh, about 10, 11. I started. Didn't really take it seriously. It hurt your little fingers when... You know, you got to get past that. You got to develop corns on your fingers, and then once you've done that, you're up and running. If you're interested, but you know, I kind of went to a reasonable school, and it was just homework, 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 and kind of learning the guitar was a diversion from that. Really, when did you yeah. turn to the bass? Somebody at school had a bass to sell. All and right, I've yeah. got it. And then I got it home. Then you realise that as soon as you've got a bass at home by yourself and you haven't got an amplifier, it's, <laughs> you, can't, you can't hear it. And then when you kind of work out if you jam it against the wardrobe, you can just about hear it and then you learn a bit. And then what I used to do, I used to take the, the jack lead and take the leads off the end and attach it to the stylus, the wires on the stylus on my mum and dad's radiogram. It sounded great, actually, you know, <laughs> and then play along um but then you're playing bass and you think oh you kind of need to play with somebody else really so it was kind of like a key to um looking out for other people and that's where i met Stephen paul you know i got working for malcolm mclaren and um they used to come into the shop you know i've sat down a couple of things with some mates at school but no real big deal but that's how it all started out you know, and then well, I, we found we started out by kind of learning covers, and then sometimes you know what they're a bit too hard, right? And they don't sound anything like it. But then you think, <laughs> Hang on, we got our own song here, you know. So that's kind of quite a good way of beginning to write, really. You know, you do your version of, of what have you, and then we met John a bit further along the line. Well, yeah, my next question was, what was it like meeting Paul and uh, Steve for the first time? Yeah, just sort of interesting guys, you know, had a bit of spirit about them. Um, 
Well, they used to come into Malcolm's shop, and I, I always thought I was on the trying to nick things, you know, so I had to keep my eye on them a little bit. But they got talking to Malcolm, I overheard them saying they were looking for a bass player because the bloke they had, Del, who was, I think, Paul's sister's fiance, never used to turn up. And I said, well, I've got a bass. I never said I could play it. I said, i got one. <laughs> and they said, what, what's your favourite band? And I said, The Faces, which it was, and that was their favourite band and all. And so that, we was off really, you know. I don't know if we ever really kind of bonded as mates, but, you know, there was a good reasonable friendship there. Um, yeah. You said about keeping an eye on uh, Paul and Steve, not nick you from the shop, but when you joined, you didn't they have loads of amps and gear that they nicked? They did have a bit of a selection and stuff, yeah. But I said, where'd you get that from? And they said, don't ask, so I didn't. <laughs> yeah. um, but was... he said, come back to haunt you, you know. I've had a couple of nice guitars gone missing. And yeah. It does, uh, you know, so perhaps there's a bit of karma involved in it. What was Malcolm McLaren like at this time? Interesting bloke, 10 years older than us. Sort of a bit like a hip older brother. He'd been around. He had a very good address book. Um, then he had ideas, but we had ideas too. And I kind of think, you know, people say he put us together. He didn't. We met sort of under the umbrella of his shop and he helped us out. And I kind of think that um, nobody would have heard of us if it wasn't for him, but equally nobody would have, heard of, would have heard of him if it wasn't for us, you know. So yeah, there was quite a symbiotic relationship, as they say. Uh, what was it like when John came in for his audition? What did you think of him? Interesting. <laughs> um, it, it was a strange kind of um, scenario, really. You know, it, it was awkward. He he sang along to a couple of songs in front of the jukebox that Malcolm had by then, and you know, it was quite an artificial thing. But he made the made the most of it, and there was something about him that we thought we'd run with it. And then it just took off, and that's that's what happened. Yeah, yeah. As soon as the Sex Pistols started, uh, you were arguing straight away. What? Well, what? not really. No, we we had quite a good working relationship. Me and John, and you know, Stephen Paul were always. I felt were a bit of a double act, um, and we got a lot of done in a reasonable short period of time. And most of the songs that ended up on the album. Stem from that. But then I feel, and I'm not the only person to say this, once John, as the lead singer, started getting his face in the paper, and he, he changed a bit, and I think he became a bit too full of himself. So, yeah. There you go. Is that what kind of made you leave in the end? Didn't help. Yeah. Know. Um, You got, you was at St. Martin's College, and you got the Sex Pistols the first gig there. What was that gig like? Well, it was a mess. It, 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 it um, ended up as a punch-up because John was kicking the PA system around that belonged to the main band, Bazooka Joe. <laughs> it transpired. They were, they, it's not they didn't like our music. They was annoyed that John was kicking their PA around. And they were really, really worried because I only found out this out in recent years is that they bought it on HP and they hadn't finished paying for it yet. <laughs> Yeah, but it's funny when you do bands, you know, there's all these little things that kind of add up to what the public's perception of you is. But, you know, there's kind of pitfalls and muck-ups and mistakes that I'm sure lots of bands go through, but it's just our one was um, kind of broadcast to the world at large at an early stage. Um, <clears throat> the Sex Pistols gigs got more and more chaotic as time went on. Is there a gig that stands out to you? Um, they, they were all kind of pretty chaotic, really. Um, I think the early one, we played at a strip club in Soho and John was breaking the, the footlights and this kind of Maltese gangster guy, I think his strip club it was, had just come walked right through this small crowd, leant on the stage and stared at him for about <laughs> two and John tried to ignore him, but the bloke was having none of it. And then John behaved himself after that. <laughs> yeah. um, like you said, the band started off doing covers. How long into being in the band did you start writing your own stuff? Well, pretty soon. I mean, as I said, but um, sorry, I'm just. Okay. Um, 
you know, you start trying to play something, it don't sound anything like it, and then you've got your own thing. So that was pretty much from the get-go, really, yeah. What was the first song you wrote? Well, Steve and Paul had a couple of ideas. The very first set of demos had problems, um, no feelings and pretty vacant on it. So they were really early on. We did them in 75, I think, with um, Chris Spedding producing, who was a mate of Malcolm's, used to come in the shop. That's 75, a very early 76. So that was... You know, they were some of the earlier things we were knocking around. You know, we all mucked in and we did our bit. And, you know, I like to feel that I, the first three singles had a lot to do with me musically. And Pretty Vacant, that's my lyric as well. You know, John changed two lines in the second verse. I didn't realise he'd done it because the PA system we had in our rehearsal place, we couldn't hear him, which I think contributed to his vocal style <laughs> a little. You know, he was all turned full up. And we didn't know how to set up the PA properly, so yeah. Well, what about Pretty Vacant? Then, how did what inspired you to write that? Well, that Malcolm had been going backwards and forwards to America. Um, he got hip to some of the bands over there, none of which had made records, and he brought back some photographs and this list of song titles which I didn't really know what it was, but kind of looking back, it was probably a set list, but one of the songs on it was called In the Arms of Venus de Milo. And if I don't know you know much about art or not, but the statue of Venus de Milo by David, the arms have fallen off. So for to have a song called In the Arms of was kind of a bit weird. And the next song was called Blank Generation. And that kind of got me thinking. And then there was a lot of shit going down in mid-70s. England, London, three-day week, people on strike. Yeah as bad as the mummy got now. Um, there was an air of despondency around. And they all came together and it gave me the idea of pretty vacant. You know. Yeah. Uh, there's a gig the Sex Pistols did in Manchester at the Lesser Free Trade Hall. That, uh, it's quite a big gig for people in Manchester because there was Peter Hope, Bernard Sumner, Morrissey and Marky Smith in the crowd. Do you remember that gig? Well, I remember we did two shows there. One, yeah. Both set up by the Buzzcocks. They because they wanted a band to support, and they didn't get it together for the first one, but they did for the second. Um, yeah, it was one of our first times up north. Um, I mean, the thing is, when you're in a band, you get, you get all the way there, you do a sound check, you go and get fish and chips, then you go on and you play, and then you go home. You don't yeah. you can't very see what's going on. What I do remember about the second gig was the Buzzcocks we met, and... Pete Shelley was on guitar and Howard Devoto was the singer. And um, he only only had a, half a guitar, you know, the top bit of the body. There wasn't one. I said, what happened? Did you, you know, why did you cut it off? He said, oh, I didn't cut it off. It fell off. <laughs> it gets off from Woolworths. And then they finished up their set with Boredom. It's got that two-note guitar solo. And then it went on and on and on. And the set finished by Howard Devoto just pulling his lead out. I don't know if he did it be because he was fed up with listening to the thing or they worked out it was some kind of arty thing but it was very kind of effective yeah yeah uh, there were also a lot of other people in, in your crowds that went on to be musicians like Shane McGowan Billy Idol, Susie Sue did you know all these yeah, to say hi to. Shane wasn't really part of our crowd, but he did come to some of the gigs. Um, he was supposedly famous for having his ear bit enough but he, at one of our gigs, but um, he's still got two ears, you know. <laughs> um, I think somebody didn't have a go at it, and it was bleeding. Uh, yeah, Billy was around, and Susie and the other people. You know. now, but from that, back then... There was a whole bunch of other people, you know, like fashion designers and people are doing artwork and photographers. And another guy who was around a lot was Bernard Rhodes, who went on to manage the clan. He was mates of Malcolm. Well, that that time in London, at that particular place down the wrong end of the King's Road, it was very interesting and um, 
what's the word? Uh, you know, it was very um, influential place to be. Nobody really realised it at the time, but just by some kind of gut feeling, you kind of thought you was in, you know, in the epicentre of um, kind of hip London, I suppose. Yeah. Now you mentioned the clash. What were your relationship like with the bands at that time? Kind of mates with them, really. You know, like I knew Mick from before he was in the clash. He was trying to get a band together. Um, and he was mates with Tony James. I remember we let him use our rehearsal place we had. Steve played drums, I played bass, Mick played guitar, and he was checking out Chrissy Hind as a singer. So this was a good year before the, the clash form. So we, we knew each other a bit. And then I knew Joe from the 101ers who were around playing, and they were one of the better bands on the pub rock scene. And then Bernard Rhodes said, I, I found a singer for The Clash. Because he, he was helping Matt, Mick get The Clash together. And I said, who is it? And he said, Joe Strummer. And I said, well, he's a bit old, isn't he? You know, when, you know, when you're young, you think like somebody's two years older than you. He's really old. <laughs> which he was. And Bernie said, no, I'll have 10 years off of him. But, you know, Joe worked great. It worked great with The Clash. So so we was all around, you know, mixing somehow. Um, yeah. You know, you signed with VMI, but not for too long, obviously. Uh, what was it like getting your first record deal, though? Exciting, exciting. Um, we was all keen to make it work. Um, and then the Bill Grundy show happened, and then they had to drop us. But the record company never wanted to drop us. EMI is a big, you know, international electronics firm, and um. The head guy would have dinner with the Queen or something like that, and then they got these oiks on the telly swearing their heads off. <laughs> and they and the record company part were made to get rid of us, but the guys on the shop floor didn't want to get rid of us, you know. So yeah, well that leads me on to the Bill Grundy incident. What was that day like? It was all very last minute. We was rehearsing for the Anarchy tour. Paul came through. Saying we got you this TV show because Queen had pulled out. Queen were, were like label mates on here, mate. And we wasn't going to do it because we was busy um, rehearsing. And we'd not long signed to EMI and we was on £25 a week. <laughs> right. Um, and Malcolm said, Well, if you don't do it, you won't get your wages this week. So we did it. And then all hell broke loose. And then everything changed overnight. You know, did you see Bill Grundy before the actual interview, or was that no. the first time you saw him? No, but we were sitting, you know, in front of the cameras, and um, there was like little stairs that came down from the control room, and he came down and started the interview. And it, you seen the interview, just the way it went. But he certainly had a bit of a drink. He wasn't rolling drunk, but um, he just picked on the wrong blokes at the wrong time. Yeah, he was talking to you at first as well, wasn't he, at the start of the interview? Yeah. yeah. Could you tell it was going to go like it did? Not really. Steve had had a bit more to drink than the rest of us in the green room before we went on, and it kind of kicked in halfway to the thing, and he started swearing his head off. Um, so, yeah, blame Steve. But, you know, Steve says this himself. That's when everything changed. And instead of being like a sort of a band by the kids for the kids, you know, like the early Who or something, it just became this media exercise. And while it was fun, you know, then we was banned from playing, but then we wasn't really banned from playing, but that was the line that Malcolm was making out. And I just sort of found it to be a bit dishonest and I got a bit disheartened, really. Now, whether that was a good move, I don't know, but I just turned 20. Yeah. You know. You don't, always, you don't always make the best decisions, but then I was quite happy. I got on with quite doing some other stuff, and then I started getting my Rich Kids band together. And we signed to EMI, and I didn't rush to sign to EMI, but they were interested, and every other record company was. And you know, I thought I thought we were pretty good, really. You know, we sort of had our moment in the sun. It didn't quite take off, but lots of things don't quite take off. You know, I still think we were quite a well-respected band. Uh, well, on the rich kids, uh, what's it like when you leave a band like the Sex Pistols and then start a new band? Is there a lot of expectation? A lot of expectation. 
Um, but you soon find out the way the press works, you know, and they love to set you up and then knock, knock you down, you know. I mean, you know, we're constantly compared to the Sex Pistols. I didn't want to be anything like the Sex Pistols, you know. And it, it was a lot of negativity, and it kind of wore me down a little bit, really, you know. Yeah. But the band, band was still good, you know. Yeah, how could you only, yeah, that album's a good album. How could you only brought out one? Sorry, say that again? Why was that the only album you brought out? Well, um, we had a, quite a bad backlash, really, even though we had good reviews for the album. And then, uh, I, don't, I don't know, it just didn't quite totally click. And then Midge and Rusty did a side project with Steve Strange, which became bizarre. And then they wanted to go all the electronic, and I didn't. And then I got a phone call from Iggy Pop. So next thing I was playing my Biggie Pop around Europe and America, which was interesting, you know. Okay, if we get on to Wiggy Pop soon, I just want to talk about um, just the last bit of the Sex Pistols. Uh, a lot of fans say you were the most musically talented one in the band. So yeah, but I don't, I don't say a lot, though, does it? <laughs> <laughs> but was it more like gutting for you when they brought in Sid who, wasn't, who couldn't even play the bass? No, not really, because back then I'd, I'd had enough of it, you know. I kind of, yeah, it, it'll become a bit awkward. I'd sort of, me and John were at loggerheads, um, you know, and Paul put it to me, oh, can't you just pretend you like John? And I thought, well, if you can't see that I've actually come up with quite a lot of music, which is kind of important in a van, <laughs> you know, so do you. And then I, I walked, but then it got reported that I was sat for liking the Beatles, which wasn't true, you know. So um, that, that kind of hurt. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. Oh, I've just mentioned it now, but all my life, people always bring that up, you know. So, yeah. Do you still get that today? Yeah, about the Beatles. Quite a lot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, what's my next question? Oh, yeah. You obviously got a lot of backlash for that Bill Grudy interview. Um, and you couldn't tour and stuff. What was that time like? What the tour? Well, the tour we did was a tour which we didn't do. It was it was initially fun, but it kind of um it got a bit boring really because we was driving around the country going to play, and then we weren't allowed to. And it, it was kind of frustrating, you know. And I think all that yeah, you know, your first big proper tour, and you can't play anywhere, you know. And it, it kind of got on top of everybody in one way or another and I think it led to kind of divisions within the band really yeah like you've worked all you've worked hard to get to that point and you can't have it yeah it was like somebody pulled the rug out from under your feet you know yeah yeah but, you know I still thought it was kind of fun you know it was a funny side to it there was lots of things mixed up in there and the heartbreak has come over from America and they were quite nefarious characters and the clash were on the tour, you know, and they, they just became quite factional. It's crazy how young the band was and you're still uh, upset like a lot of the country, isn't it? Yeah, but on the other hand, it's a band like Small Faces, but like kind of 16, 17 when they had their first hit record, so we weren't that young. No, but... no, but yeah, yeah. Um... John Lydon said in the past that he used to, after that all that he used to get attacked in the street and stuff. Did you ever get any of that? I didn't, but John always delighted and looked a bit more outlandish to me. So you know, yeah. he, the face of it, yeah, he shouldn't have been attacked. Yeah, that was wrong, but at least, um, I, I don't know. You know, he, he kind of stood his ground and he wouldn't pretend to be something he wasn't. I wouldn't pretend to be somebody I wasn't, but I, I wasn't, you know, the front man and, and such a um, sticking out kind of figure. Um, so I didn't get attacked in the street. But on the other hand, I could always drive. Right? <laughs> That's probably got something to do with it. You know? <laughs> I always um, had a cheap, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've mentioned Sid Vicious. Uh, he was at a lot of your gigs. Did you know him well before he joined the band? Not really, I knew of him. Um, he was John's mate. Yeah. Know. So like, You actually played with him in a one-off gig, didn't you? Yeah, we did a one-off gig, I think, 
that was after the rich kids, probably yeah. 78 or something like that. And we were neighbours, we were sitting in a pub, and we just thought we'd do a gig together for a laugh to just, to just prove to people that we weren't total, you know, enemies. What was he like when he wasn't, like, in the band and stuff? Was he the same kind of person? He was kind of a likeable nitwit, really. You know, he was always spoiling for a flight with somebody who would normally give him a hiding. <laughs> yeah. I called the Wiggy Pop, you toured with him and you played on his album, Soldier. What was that like? Because I know you're a big fan of his. Well, it was, you know, Iggy had been touring for years. It was all after doing the Pistols and the Rich Kids when you had your mates as roadies who didn't really know what they were doing. It was all a bit of a wing and a prayer. Iggy had been touring. He had a proper crew and he was doing quite decent-sized gigs and flying here and flying there. He was just very kind of professional, you know, which is kind of weird when you think about Iggy Pop, but... He's he's like, and also he's like two people. He's James Osterberg during the day, and he sort of slowly turns into Iggy Pop just before showtime. But you know, that's, that's how you kind of keep sane, really. I think you know. Well, Blondie played a gig with him last year. Oh, was it this year at Crystal Palace? Yeah, I played. I did it. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Was it a good day? Yeah, it was a really good day. And Stephen Paul played with a generation sex thing beforehand. Yeah, it was all the old legs came up. But it was good, you know. There's, all those bands, there's some great songs between all of them. And they they still, you know, Debbie Harry's great. Blondie are great. It's, it's fun to do. Biggie Pop's great, you know. And Stephen Paul are pretty good as well. So, you know, what's... So like, yeah, it was a good vibe. Big crowd, good vibe. Uh, where was you when you heard about the death of Sid Vicious? I think we, I was on the way to do a Rich Kids gig somewhere. Really? Um, yeah. Was um, it shock? Not really, no. It was like a slow train coming. Really, um, yeah. It was sad, but it was, you know, you live by the sword, you die by the sword, really. He got himself into too many wrong scrapes, I think, without thinking it through. Now, I well, don't wish the I don't wish the demise of um, anybody of that age at all. But um, don't, uh, Sid and me was a kind of a, a funny one, you know, odd, odd, in a funny, peculiar kind of one to kind of take on board. Yeah. So, what did you think about the? <clears throat> sorry. What did you think about the whole Nancy situation with the in uh, New York? Um, well, I I met Nancy quite a few times, and she was a bit of a I don't know. Well, she was a young girl trying to find her way in the world, but uh, you know, she's drug addict. Um, she was kind of trouble, really, you know. And yeah. I think she led Sid astray, but on the other hand, he kind of probably wanted to be led astray. You've said before that you don't think he was involved in the murder. Do you still believe that? Well, Stib Bates told me that it was like not a case of mistaken identity. I'm, I'm not going to go into it all, but Stib was with them on the day at the Chelsea Hotel. He told me what happened, and it, the whole thing was just a mess. You know, Sid didn't do it, but it looked like he did it. So, do you think if he had it, he'd have? Got life in prison. Well, probably. I mean, circumstantially, it looked like you did it. Yeah. No, nobody was going to, you know, because they was all up to nefarious activities. Nobody wanted to admit to being there and say what they'd all been up to. So, you know, there wasn't really any kind of way out of it. And he'd already been in Rikers. Then I'm sure he didn't have a great time in there, and I think the thought of going back there was um, just too much for him. Yeah, yeah. Um, I read somewhere Malcolm McLaren saying he paid for somebody to clean the knife. Do um, you think he's just making that up? No idea. No, no. no. Um, so back onto the Sex Pistols, you reunited in 1996. What were those reunion tours like? Um, well, great, you know. All around the world, everybody loved this. Um, John was always hard work, but you know, he's a good front man. 
Yeah, he's hard work. So, what when you're not on stage, what did you not like hang around with each other? Not particularly. <laughs> no, no. Was it like that in the early days? After he got his face in the papers, yeah. <laughs> or until he got his face in the papers, yeah. What got too egotistical? <laughs> <laughs> what um oh, back on that your last gig the first time around was in Holland. What was the audiences like abroad? Did they get the Sex Pistols? Uh, it was a bun bunch of student hippie types, really. Um we did two gigs. Where did we do? We played two gigs at a place called the Milky Way or the Milkveg, which is in the place called the Paradiso in Amsterdam. They were pretty good, I think, as I remember. We also did a TV show with the Three Degrees and Golden Earring. Um, and then we played in Rotterdam where we got bottled. <laughs> is that the way uh, you come on stage and somebody asked you why you didn't play? No, that was in Dundee. Oh, was it? Yeah. And yeah. he said, I think, uh, we thought you liked getting bottled. Yeah. <laughs> um, from that was, bit, what you say, sorry? People are a bit daft. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. From an outsider's perspective, it doesn't look likely at all. But Steve Jones said last year that never, like, never say never to a Sex Pistols reunion in the future. What's your thoughts on that? Never say never, you know. But there's a lot of... Um, obstacles to it and I don't wake up in the morning thinking oh you know wouldn't it be great to reform the band but you know last since lockdown's finished I've been really busy yeah I've, you know I put an album out it's got really good reviews I've been gigging with that I've been gigging with Blondie I'm always doing different sessions with different people I'm now booked up until September next year with Blondie stuff and my stuff and other stuff um it's fitting it all in, really, you know. There, there's a whole world out there where you can go and play. And I like doing it, you know. I, I, I do big shows with Blondie. I do sort of reasonable size shows with my stuff. And it's like a sine wave of achievement. But that's what I do, really. It's fuck all on the telly, apart from <laughs> bad news at the moment. Yeah. And um, I'd rather go and do a gig and earn a few bob. Yeah. You know. Now... I'm 67. I've actually reached retirement age, um, but I like going to play, you know, so, and earning a few bob. So, it's, Do you know what? People always miss this about musicians. Why are you doing this and why are you doing that? It's work. Yeah, yeah. You know? So you're open to no, it, maybe. I do different things and I'm not a bad bass player, really. You know, I think as an, my art is trying to write songs and get them out there, and that's the arty bit. But the kind of the functional bit is being not a bad bass player. Anything is to kind of make the song work. But I'm always getting to ask to do things. Night before last, I ended up playing at the London Palladium only for one song with Susie Quattro and Boy George. Oh, and, really? You know, and they said, Do you fancy doing it? And you think, Well, is this cool or not? But actually, Susie Quattro is quite cool and it's fun. What about you get Boy to... George? He's great. I love Boy George. I've, yeah. I've, I've, known, I've known him since the punk days. He was always around then. He was a bit younger than everybody else, but he was around. He's always had his finger on the pulse of what's going on. He's got a fantastic voice. He's a great guy. He's funny. He's astute. He's clever. And he can wander around like that because I know darn well he's got a good write-up, so he can back it up, you know. That's it, yeah. Yeah. Big, he's, he's a big bloke. <laughs> uh, this is my last question on the Sex Pistols, but um, hey. <laughs> you check like still to this day, people say you changed the lives. I had Brian Cannon on this podcast who did the Oasis sleeves in the nineties, and when right. I told him you were coming on, he said, "Oh, tell him like I'm a big fan. He changed my life." Do you oh. still get that to this day? Yeah, all the time. I always say, "But don't blame me." <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, the International Swingers, a super group you did, how did well, that come about? Well, no, it weren't a super group. It was a bunch of mates doing some shows in California for a laugh. That's what it was. It wasn't really a super group. You know, and I think even any super group that's called a super group, it's normally people who are mates, you know. Now, that happened that 
it might happen that they've all done stuff separately in the past, but it's normally just mates, really, you know. And that was yeah. no different, you know. And on top of that, super groups end up playing Wembley Stadium or somewhere like that. I mean, we turned little clubs in California. But you know what? Doing little clubs in California in January when it's nice and sunny and it's pissing down over here is no bad thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Where's your favourite place to play? Oh, every everywhere is kind of pretty good, really. Yeah. The people are the same all around the world. You know, they want to kind of eat, get on with their mates, work go and let off steam without too much lateral hindrance and everybody's like that around the world really but I over the past few years just before lockdown I got to do some very interesting things I was invited I went and played on the the border between North and South Korea with some Korean people that was interesting and I even got involved in doing a thing in Ramallah in Palestine and saw what was going on down there on the West Bank with you know the Israeli settlers and the way they miss the Palestinians are mistreated and met some of the most lovely people there. And when I came back, I thought to myself, mm, what do I think about this? And I thought, well, if you put people in cages, you shouldn't be too surprised when they want to rattle it, you know. It, and this was before all this trouble, which is horrendous. You know, now, yeah. I'm not particularly pro-Palestinian, I'm certainly not pro Hamas. And I'm certainly not anti-Semitic, but what the Israeli government are doing, it, you know, it's it's a land grab. They want to get rid of the Palestinians totally when they're supposed to share it. And I think what they're doing is, um, I don't like what was done to them in the Second World War, really. You know, it's almost like they're getting their own back, but not on the people that did it to them. Yeah, so, it's, uh, bad news, isn't it? It's wrong. It's wrong. You know. Now, that doesn't excuse Hamas for doing what they did. But on the other hand, I don't think it was quite as bad as it's been portrayed. And I think the Israeli government have used it as an excuse to do, um, you know, the slang grab. Maybe I'm naive, but I don't think... I've been around. I'm not as naive as people make me out to be. And... Yeah. Is there anything else you want to say on that matter? Or... No, that's kind of it, really, you know. And, and just and, and the other thing, you know, those marches that have been going on and Suella Braven and calling them hate marches, they're not. They're just decent people. In the main, there's always a few people, but in the main, they're saying there should be a ceasefire and they should talk about it a bit more. You know, that that people who are anti, people getting slaughtered, you know, and it's all disproportionate to what happened, really, I think. Yeah. Uh, are we okay to just go back on to Blondie? Yeah. Is it through Clem Burke that you got into play with Blondie? Yeah, it was, it's getting off two years ago now. I was cooking a risotto at home. It was nearly ready and the phone rang and I wasn't going to answer it. I was with a mate. And they said, who is it? I said, oh, it's Clem. I've been stirring my risotto. <laughs> And they said, well, I'll stir it, answer the phone, it's Clem. And he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm making the risotto, get on with it. Right. Then he, and he said, well, what are you doing musically? And I said, well, I've got this, that and the other. Why are you asking? And he said, well, we just start rehearsing with our old bass player. It's not working out. I don't really know for why. He said, can you come over? And I said, when? You know, thinking in a couple of months or something. He said, next week. <laughs> and, oh, oh, oh. Uh, I said, let me have a think. And I thought about it. And I thought, yeah, all right, I'll do it. And since then, you know, I've been all around America. We've done massive gigs. We've been Mexico and Bogota and somewhere else. And yeah, it's kind of good. And you enjoy yeah. playing with them then? Yeah. Yeah. How's the new album sounding? Is it meant to be an album out? You know, we've recorded an album. I haven't yeah. heard the thing yet. It's been in the can for a while. Um, I'm not sure what the. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure when it's coming out, but it, it was good doing, you know, in New York recording. Um, they're all good players. Uh, it's great playing with Clem. You know, I played with Clem on lots of different sort of airbrain projects over the years, so we play quite well with each I, other. 
it's not important knowing like who you're playing with. Do you buzz off of each other? Yeah, we. Uh, yeah, I think we do. Um, you know, I played with loads of different people, and you know, one of the tricks of being a musician, bass player, is is making it work. Yeah, but some people are more of a battle. Okay, no, not some people are more of a battle. Some people are easier to play with than others, right? And fun is really easy, you know. And I think it's because we like similar kinds of music, and we're both sort of working class blokes from of a similar age and a set of influences. And you know, if he does one thing, I'll do that, and if I do one thing, he'll do that because he knows that over the expanse of musical time, those kind of things work, you know. But you just do it intuitively. Um. Yeah. Did you enjoy playing Glastonbury this year? It was good playing it, but backstage it's like it's very corporate. Yeah, right? I can imagine. Yeah. I have a particular pass to get into this bit, and then a different pass for that one. And, and you know, it was the right pain. And I even wanted to see Elton John. Never yeah. seen Elton. Not a big fan of his. I can appreciate him, and it was supposed to be his last UK gig. And even though. We were second on the bill to him. They wouldn't let us on the stage because we didn't have the right pass. <laughs> it was really? ridiculous. Yeah. Jeez. So, I, so I, I went, I showed them. I went to see Queens of the Stone Age instead in one of the other fields. But I did earlier on in the day from the side of the stage see Cat Stevens, which is fantastic. Yeah. What were Queen of the Stone Age like? Did you enjoy them? Yeah, I've seen them before and I've met them. They're good guys, you know. And in fact, when we toured in, um, with Blondie last year in the States, the dam supported us, and Troy, who's in Queens of the Stone Age, was playing guitar for the dam. Oh, yeah. All right, yeah. So, you know, I, I didn't see them. I saw them, but I didn't meet them at Glastonbury. But, yeah, yeah. You know, when you're on the road, you meet all these people and you hang out a little bit, you know, and I've known the dam, although it's a different version of the dam, since the year dot. You know, I know Dave, I know Captain. Um, and, and Paul Gray used to be the bass player. He's a very good bass player, I like Paul. He used to be an Eddie in the Hot Rods, you know. And I was going to see him in 1975 playing in the Kensington pub. We all go back a long way, you know. So unless you've had a fist fight over some bird, which <laughs> is kind of rare, most people will rub along all right, you know. Yeah. Would you there the, <clears throat> sorry, was you there the whole weekend at Glastonbury or just that day? That day. Oh, yeah, yeah. As we've been gigging elsewhere or traveling, and um, yeah, and then we went straight off after the show and we went to Dublin. And a couple of days later, we did like a double header show with Sting, who was kind of very good. You know what? I was quite pleased. I, I really rate Sting as a bass player, and he's written some great songs, you know, and to sing and play bass at the same time is kind of our work, really, but um, yeah. But not only did I go and see watch him play, we did two shows with him all the way through just to watch his bass playing. When we was playing, he was watching me. Really? Yeah, yeah. He's been around a while, has he? Yeah, he's he's um he's older than me, you know. But he's he, he's a you know, regardless of what you think the the music. Although I like some of it, I really like that. Dream of the Blue Turtles album, you know, with if you love somebody and stuff like that. Things are class acts, you know, he's a class act. That's like when I had Midge and the Rich Kids. Midge is a class act, you know, he's real pro, he knows what he's doing. Uh, um, lots of people are. And to have any longevity in the music business is you got to know what you're doing, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, that leads me to my next question, yeah. actually. Hey, this look. A lot of people can have one hit here or one hit there, but people who sustain a career for 35, 40 years, you've got to take your hat off to them, you know. And I'm not talking about me as a, as a bass player doing a bit of this and a bit of that, but you know, but people, you know, like Sting or Iggy Pop or even Debbie Harry or David Bowie or somebody like that, you know, to have success after success after success because. They kind of worked out what the cool thing to do at that time is, and they got the right team behind them because they decided what the right team is. It's a lot of work, and you got to take your hat off to them. You know? Yeah, exactly. Well, it's like Kelton John. Did you see the? Did you see the picture of the crowd watching him after? 
Yeah, but you know what? The, the crowd that was watching him was the same same crowd that was watching us. Yeah, yeah. They just stayed for Elton John. Well, no, as I was saying, I wanted to, but they wouldn't let me on the stage. No, I'm saying the crowd came to see you and they just stayed to see you, see you all after. Yeah, it's, that's what happens at festivals, you know. They, yeah. People getting their money's worth. It's a fortune to get into Glastonbury. I thought it was 300 quid. It's like 500 pounds or something for so a weekend. Got... Be on like a list, aren't you? You're not guaranteed a ticket for it either. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's not. Um... Do you know what I went? To the, the the only festival I stayed over ever as a punter was I went to the Reading Festival in 1973 to see the Faces, and me and my mate ended up sharing a laundrette bag for the night because we had the, we had planned to stay over but decided to, so he was ill prepared. But it put me off going to festivals for life. I don't mind going if I'm getting paid for playing. <laughs> you got a backstage loo, you know, that's all right. But yeah. Sod that. So <laughs> when people do it, you know, good luck to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, my next question was you've had your new album, Consequences, coming out this year. Did you enjoy writing the album? Yeah. And I wrote the song quite a while back. I started working on it just before for lockdown it would have come out a couple of years earlier but you know it, it put everybody back you know yeah. everybody in life anyway but particularly musicians and stuff so it was a bit of a struggle getting it out but some of those songs were written a long while back and kind of predicting you know with Brexit and Boris Johnson and the rise of Trump in the States, I'm sort of railing against that, really. And I like to think, I've been... What's happened to Boris Johnson? What's happening to Trump now, you know? Yeah. They're kind of under the... So I like to feel my um, my songwriting and what I'm going on about was a bit prescient, is the word, I think. Prescient. Well, yeah. Just one more Sex Pistols thing. Sorry, but... 50 years ago, you were writing like Alecky in the UK. Did you think you'd still be writing political songs now? Um, you just write what comes to your mind, you know. And I think it's been a ridiculous, I think, I don't know what your politics are, but I think, you know, in the Western world, there's been a ridiculous lurch to the right that is only serving the pe the interests of the people. You pull all the strings and they don't really give a toss about anybody else. And I think you kind of got to reflect that, really. Now, the only thing then is you think, oh, I've got a platform and I'll get my record on the radio, you know, and you can tell people what you're thinking and maybe they'll rally behind you a little bit. But now it's hard to get a song that's even slightly political on the radio. Yeah. You know, BBC won't play it. You know, that's, that's the problem. So... You know, catch twenty two. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, that re release. Yeah, everybody's just trying to dumb everybody down, really. You know, and pat you on the head. Now oh, you get on with you doing what you're doing, and we'll be, we'll just get on with fleecing everybody. And that's the way I say it, and it's wrong. Yeah. So, well, it's like the lock. I don't really, I don't really understand politics. I don't get too into it, but it's like the lockdown things and that they were all having the parties and stuff, and nobody could visit friends or family on it. Well, there you go. If if they're in government and everybody's locked down and can't do this and they're all having parties and they're not worried about cashing anything because they're all having parties, what does that tell you? Yeah, so about what, now I'm not I'm not dis disputing, I mean, what was going on in Italy and China with people being ill and dying is, you know, heavy duty stuff. But come later on, you know, how can they have a Christmas knees up when if you sort of spoke to the milkman, you'd catch COVID, you know. It's, it don't ring true. Yeah, so. I understand what you're saying, yeah. Um, so, you've had a busy... Oh, no, sorry. You had the book out as well. Did you enjoy writing that? Yeah. It's just kind of good to get out of your system. You know, people have been... I wrote a book many years ago, and people saying, are you going to do a follow-up? You know, a follow-up, and somebody approached me and said, from a publishing company, and said... You know, would be interested in it, and I thought, yeah, okay, do it. You know, and also, I did a lot of it while I was on tour with Blondie in the states. And you, when you're doing big shows, you can't do a big show 
every day of the week, you know, and you can't be in California and come back to London each time. So yeah. you've got quite time on your hands, you know. So that's one of the What is it like for you touring? Is it exhausting? I know you said you got a lot of time off, but like do is it the same routine and stuff and being away from home? What's it like? It's um well, it's kind of the blondie stuff. You tend to stay in nice hotels and that's kind of cool. But you're also flying 12 hours somewhere. And then it takes you three days to get over the jet lag and you go and do what you do. And then you go somewhere else and it takes you another two days to get over that jet lag. And then you do something else and you come home. And coming east is always worse than you got jet lag for a week. It's kind of... <laughs> now, really, it sounds like, I'm moaning, but it's as you get older, it's hard work. But yeah. that's kind of what you do. But on the other hand, you get to see the world. You know, and I've got friends in different places around the world that I've kind of kept in contact with over the years, and you get to see them, which you wouldn't normally do. So it's uh, pros and cons. Pros and cons, yeah. Well, my last question is you've had a busy 2023, but what have you got in store for the future? Busy 24. I mean, in December, which is nearly upon us, um, I've actually got about 10 or 12 things around the north of England. You know, I've, I've got a couple of book events. I've got a couple of record store things. Um, and I've got about 10 solo shows, an evening with Glenn Matlock thing, which just made my acoustic guitar, which always goes down very well. Going up to Scotland and uh, mid the Midlands and... And it takes me right up to the 22nd of December in London. And then I've got a few weeks off. And then I've got some dates with my American band um, at the end of January in California, which is good timing because it's going to be flipping cold here. And Clem's going to play drum in Gilby Clark from Guns N' Roses and a guy called Steve Fishman. So we've got half a dozen dates there. I'm going to do a little event with Slim Jim. And then I've got a tour I did before with the Lust for Life band. We do the Lust for Life, Iggy Pop's Lust for Life album. That's in February, I think. And then in March, my band, my English band, are going to go out and we're opening up for Stiff Little Fingers around. Oh, yeah. and, then and, and then March, April is probably going to be more blondy stuff taking me through the summer. So, yeah, going to be busy. Yeah, good. Cool. Uh, well, that's the end of the interview, but I had a great time. Thank you for coming on. So there you go. All right. All right, thank you. Right, there you go. See you. you too. See you.